morning, everyone. I'm Gönül Tol. I'm the director of Turkey Studies at the Middle East Institute. I'm very happy to welcome you all to our eighth annual conference on Turkey. Each year, as we convene this conference, we find keen interest in Turkish matters. 2017 was uh, very dramatic and uh, a difficult year for Turkey, for its neighbors and its allies, including the United States. So we, are, we appreciate that so many of you uh, are making time today to join us in our discussion. Our midday keynote speaker, uh, the Honorable Michel Müntefering, is a leading voice on Turkish affairs in the Foreign Affairs Committee of the German Parliament. She will provide a first-hand report on uh, the challenges facing Ankara and Berlin. We have elected members of the Turkish and European parliaments uh, on the program as well, alongside a leader in US diplomacy toward Turkey uh, and expert analysts. Uh, you will hear our guests speaking, guest speakers on three panels. Um, we, to, to begin, we will examine Turkey's internal dynamics. Our panelists include a recent member of the Turkish parliament, a political party representative and scholars who have been uh, writing and following Turkey. After our morning coffee break, we'll turn our attention to Turkey's economy uh, with the help of three Turkish scholars uh, who teach at Washington area universities and a member of the European Parliament. After the midday break, we will hear from our keynote speaker at 1.30 p.m. We will follow with the day's final panel at two, looking at Turkey's uh, foreign relations, particularly Turkey's relations with the US, the European Union, and Russia. Uh, we will be joined by legislators from Turkey and the European Union, uh, as well as US Deputy Assistant Secretary for State, uh, of State for Southern Europe, and the Turkish uh, scholar in that conversation. As you can imagine, we are delighted uh, with the program we have assembled, and uh, I really hope you'll find the discussion valuable as well. Uh, we are recording the event, so if you miss any part of, of the conference, uh, don't worry about it. Just go back to mei.edu and you'll listen to it online. And one final note on, on today's program. For the last 71 years, the Middle East Institute is has been dedicated to balance and nonpartisan programming and analysis. We work very hard so that you hear um, to ensure that our invited speakers represent all sides of any ideological debate. So you, as the audience, can hear diverse views and make up your own minds about the uh, controversial issues. So in that spirit, this year, uh, as previous years, we reach out to prominent figures affiliated with Turkey's ruling Justice and Development Party, as well as think tankers, journalists who are close to the government, and opposition parties and scholars. Um, we are very grateful to all the speakers who agreed to appear today. I also would like to express my gratitude to uh, Mr. James Holman, he's our board member, um, for his generous support to this conference. Uh, MEI has the pleasure to work on this conference with uh, Friedrich Ebert Foundation, uh, Michael Meyer, and his team provided uh, a critical expertise and support in making this conference possible. I sincerely thank our uh, colleagues at the Friedrich Ebert Foundation for this partnership, uh, and it's my pleasure now to, ma uh, to ask Michael to greet you and to introduce our opening panel. Michael, the floor is yours. I was asked to put this name tag up. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really a real pleasure to be with you this morning. Just come back from Germany yesterday evening, and the times are not easy in Germany as well, given the coalition talks and all that. Uh, but, but, today, Turkey. Turkey does not play a role yet in the coalition talks, by the way, but this will come up. Um, as a German think and do tank, active in Turkey and in the United States and in more than 100 countries around the world, 
we have really a high interest in raising this topic and we are very proud to be able to organize this conference in crucial times in cooperation with the Middle East Institute. I would like to dwell on three areas where I think we, we also will get some interesting discussions today. Um, one is concerning Turkey's domestic situation. After the coup, the rifts aggravated between, uh, within the Turkish society between Turks and Kurds, the AKP and the opposition, Mr. Erdogan and the Gülen followers, the secularists and the devoted Muslims, pro-European and nationalists, urban centers and countryside, and between generations. And this is not a situation which should be welcomed by anyone. We should try to do as much as possible to keep the Turkish society together and not to split them. So there's, from my point of view, no political force inside to bridge these dangerous trends. And maybe we can come forward together to give some recommendations on that. Economically, as you all know, the Turkish lira is an, on an all-time low right now. Since 2000, economic development was very impressive. But now it seems to me that Turkey is facing this middle income trap. And in order to overcome such a middle income trap, Goldman Sachs identified years ago four areas how you can overcome such a middle income trap. One is macroeconomic stability, political maturity, openness of trade and investment policies, and an improvement in the quality of education. Let's see if today's conference can identify areas where Turkey has fulfilled any of these requirements. On foreign policy, Turkey and the EU relations are in deep trouble. The European Commission assesses that Turkey doesn't fulfill the Copenhagen criteria for access into the EU. The custom, customs union modernization is not on the agenda right now. The Turkish-US relations are in trouble due to so many reasons that I want just to enumerate a few of them. Different views on Syria, the Syrian Kurds, Inchilik Air Base, the Zarab trial, the arrest of Americans and the halt of visa services in Turkey, just to name a few. And now let me come to the Turkish-German relations. <laughs> they are deeply in trouble as well. Since the Gezi protests, I would say, and the violation of basic rights, the jailing of Germans, German citizens and German journalists in Turkey, the meddling of Turkish officials in the German election campaign, the refusal to German lawmakers to visit German troops on a NATO base, and the linked relocation of the Bundeswehr units outside NATO territory to Jordan. This is unprecedented, but it had happened. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot to discuss. I'm really looking forward to that, to your input and to your active participation. Uh, I would like to thank the Middle East Institute again and the staff of the MEI and the Friedrich Ebert Foundation for making this event possible. Let me now introduce the moderator of the first panel, Dr. Liesel Hinz. She is from Johns Hopkins SAIS and she is a really, really well um, informed and experienced Turkey and Middle East specialist. Dr. Liesel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you very much to, oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> 
Thank you very much for that uh, very um, kind introduction. Uh, thank you to the Middle East Institute for inviting me, to, for bringing us all here. Um, when you study Turkey every day is a fascinating day to be studying Turkey and to be following what's going on. Um, and of course, today is no different, so we have much, much, much to talk about. Um, I want to very briefly introduce our panelists as well. You have their biographies in your brochure, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on that, because obviously we have lots to talk about. Um, uh, over here we have Gunesh Murat Tezjur, who is the uh, Jalal Talabani Chair of Kurdish Political Studies uh, and also Associate Professor of Kurdish Political Studies at the University of Central Florida. Here we have Giran Özcan, who is the Washington representative of the People's Democratic Party. Um, and I actually, I'm going to use and abuse my role as moderator to just make a tiny grammatical point that I always like to make wherever I go. And if you know me, you know this. So in the, um, in the brochure, it says People's Democratic Party with the apostrophe after the people, S, which actually means single people. If you think about like the Republican People's Party, it's the party of one singular people. And in fact, the translation is peoples with the apostrophe after the S because it means multiple peoples altogether. So it's actually actually a translation and a political point that I wanted to make as well. Uh, okay, I've now abused that power. Um, over here we have uh, Ahmed Kuru, who is the, a professor of political science at San Diego State. And we also have Icon Ardemir, uh, who is a former member, uh, former parliamentary representative of the Republican People's Party um, in the Turkish Parliament, and also, of course, now a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. So as you can see, we have an extraordinarily uh, esteemed panel for this discussion. Um, you know, I was thinking about what are the sorts of issues that I want to bring up, and of course I wanted to publicize the event, so I was trying to tweet about all the different things that we could possibly cover. And I was thinking everything from, you know, the Kurdish issue, to the Alevi issue, to the, you know, what's the state of the military following the purges, to the allegations of corruption, to, um, you know, everything from things that touch on economy, things that touch on foreign policy. It's very difficult to understand the Kurdish issue without understanding Syria and Iraq. It's very difficult to understand Syria with without understanding Russia. It's very difficult to understand Russia's relationship with Turkey if you don't understand the economy. So there's a lot of connections among the panels that we're going to be seeing. Um, so I tried to tweet about it. And even with you know the ex uh, extra number of characters that were now allowed, I couldn't even get a quarter of the, those issues in. Um, so I want to see how many of those we can get in. Um, we'll obviously leave a lot of time for questions. Uh, this is a great audience. I'm sure that you'll be very interested to ask this, this fantastic panel your pressing questions. Um, but I actually want to start with a very, very general question. Um, and then we'll kind of you know drill down into the specific issues. So I want to ask all of the panelists. Obviously, again, thinking about things that are connected, it's very difficult to understand understand any of the AKP's domestic and foreign policies without understanding the upcoming elections in 2019. Um, and what are the motivations for uh, domestic and foreign policy or potentially moving up those elections, as some are now talking about. So what I want to ask the panelists is, um, what do you think the AKP or Erdogan's greatest challenge in the upcoming elections, whether they be held in 2019 or moved up to 2008, will be? And how do you think the party or he is or will try to address that challenge? Okay. Gunesh, can we start with you on that, please? Sure, yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's getting fun every day to talk about Turkey in DC, especially nowadays. Um, so let me basically just like, uh, I mean, since this is going to be the, the first time in which we will have a presidential elections, I think it is very important to emphasize that because, and I will basically link you to the Kurdish question very, like, very quickly. But the thing is that um, the main reason why the, the Kurdish initiative of the 2013 to 15 basically collapse is because of the disagreement between the, the Kurdish political movement and Erdogan regarding the Erdogan's desire to establish a presidential system. And then, then this did not work out. And it's another question whether the PKK or the Abdul Öcalan did not like it. But ultimately, we can talk about it later on. Then obviously, Erdogan basically looked for new allies. And then the new allies he obviously found in the shape of the David Bacheli and his party, MHP. And then you can also wonder like why, how on earth an opposition party wants to make a deal with the Erdogan so that he they will never have a chance to become part of a coalition government because ultimately when you establish a presidential system, it basically means that uh, a party like MHP will never take any ministerial seats. So it kind of sounds a little bit like counterintuitive, if not basically self-destructive. But then you have to basically think about the 
like again the Kurdish initiative because if you're a Turkish nationalist, your nightmare is a basic situation in which the ruling party, AKP, making a deal with the Kurdish nationalists. And this was a real possibility basically until the summer of 2015. And once the um, Bahçeli saw this possibility happening, then I think he basically thought that, well, if I cannot basically take any action, then Erdogan will still pursue this ultimate goal, and then it is better for me to basically offer this deal to Erdogan so I will have more leverage over the outcome. And this is basically what happened obviously last year and obviously then in the April of 2017 with the referendum, which was also very controversial by the way. So for Erdogan, now the challenge is basically, from like coming back to your question, is basically making sure that the Turkish nation is basically kept happy, so this become his prior concern, so that he can basically get this magic 50 plus one uh, person votes in the next uh, presidential elections, either next year or in 2019. Um, but then the challenge is obviously now we have a different arithmetic with the uh, like the entry of a new party, so-called E party, good party or whatever you want to call it in uh, English, which doesn't maybe sound very nice, but anyway, <laughs> which basically means that there is a more fragmentation in the Turkish nation's world. So this is going to be a kind of a ma major challenge for Erdogan, which basically implies that, uh, and maybe you can want to like chim in later on, um, uh, Giray, well, that basically means that he doesn't have a very strong incentive to basically take initiatives in the Kurdish question because this is not his priority. It may change, obviously, after the elections, but it will not be the basically priority for him for the foreseeable future. So he, in a sense, and let me just make my own point and then we can maybe elaborate it on later on. I mean, as a political scientist, when you look at the Turkish politics, you may get the impression that, well, okay, there is a huge polarization, there is the religious guys, there are the secular guys, and then this has been going on at least since the early Republican years. I mean, obviously the story is much more complicated and nuanced, but what I want to say is that, I mean, Erdogan is very powerful, he's a very strong leader, but at the same time, his power depends on a razor edge majority. So it can basically more like a swing, like a, it can swing either way very easily. It is not like Putin, for example, where it is a much more kind of established, institutionalized, and rentier state economy. In Erdogan's case, everything basically depends on kind of very contingent factors. And for this reason, he basically needs to, like, uh, at least from my perspective, he needs to satisfy the Turkish nationalism to make sure that he wins the uh, next round of elections. Excellent, thank you very much. Gidan? Um, just to add on, to a little bit of what Ganesh said. I think um, the 7 June elections mm -hmm. is a good um, occasion to look back at when trying to understand the well, the dangers for Erdogan and the AKP right now. Uh, because, I mean, in the run up to the June 7 elections, we saw um, how the AKP could, uh, it was, I mean, t towards the end of the peace process, well, actually, it, it had just collapsed a couple of months before the elections. But uh, we can see that Erdogan uh, really can be dictated by election arithmetics uh, before uh, di dictating his policies. And um, I think when we look at the June 7 elections and what happened with the peace process and how uh, Erdogan actually saw that the peace process wasn't benefiting him uh, numerically, at least, during the elections, and how he could suddenly swerve into the nationalist space that Ganesh was talking about. Um, and I think uh, for the elections, whether it will be held in uh, what, 2018 or 2019, um, Erdogan faces a huge, um, well, a huge risk to whatever he does, not just whether uh, the nationalist base will be fragmented, which Meral Akşener will probably uh, do with the e party we'll use the turkish um uh, turkish words for the party as yeah in english it is a bit difficult um but whether that is fragmented or not uh, erdogan will probably in terms of the country's economy for the first time um it will be at a stage where he probably won't be able to hide it as much um i think until now uh, certain cracks have been covered pretty well uh, but I think we have to look at the Zarab case uh, right now and how that could have a severe economic impact uh, in the next few months. And uh, in the run-up to the election, uh, that will probably be a, be a huge factor. And I think people are expecting that now. Uh, that's probably going to be a crack too far. It seems, I, uh, to me at least, that Erdogan's not going to be able to cover that crack as well as he's, he's done before. Um, and so... Even with an attempted coup, uh, I mean, whether you go with the conspiracy theories or not, whether Erdogan knew about it or not, we saw that, objectively speaking, that attempted coup has 
um, strengthened Erdogan's hand domestically in terms of uh, consolidating his um, significant authority on all processes in the country. Uh, so even an attempted coup in Turkey has uh, helped Erdogan on his way. Uh, so what that attempted coup couldn't succeed, um, the, the, you know, the oncoming economic crisis, which everyone is pretty much expecting right now, especially if uh, the court case in New York, uh, what kind of decisions come out there will probably be pretty significant for any election. And that, that seems to be a little funny that something thousands of miles away in the US will have a huge domestic impact uh, in Erdogan's campaign to, uh, well, be the first elected um, in the new system, the first elected president in the new system. Um, and so I think the challenges that are coming, unfortunately, aren't so much from inside the country. What Meral Akşener will do, uh, how much of an impact she'll have in actually fragmenting that nationalist vote, uh, I'm not too sure. Uh, no one expects her to make a huge gain or at least threaten any kind of uh, authority or seat or take anything in that regard from Erdogan, but the fragmentation of such a base that Erdogan has been severely trying to consolidate, especially in the past uh, one and a half years after the collapse of the peace process, will probably be significant. But I think the challenge is, if any, uh, I don't want to paint a, too much of a grim picture, but if any, will come from outside of Turkey. Okay. Excellent. Again, showing that it's very difficult to extract <coughs> domestic and foreign policy studies in Turkey. Ahmed, what is the biggest challenge and how do you think it's being faced or Thanks will be faced? Thanks for the question. For decades, I've been critical of my colleagues studying elections in Middle East and Central Asia because they study something which does not matter at all. And they say whenever you criticize someone, you don't die before finding yourself in his or her shoes. And I find myself in the same weird position discussing Turkish elections which do not matter at all. Because Erdogan will never go with any electoral results. He will rig it, he will cancel it, he has the power, no one can challenge him. He, he has full control over the media, he has full control over the economy, he has full control on bureaucracy. So then I don't really think that elections matter in Turkey. What I think matters is economy, and economically certain international policies, EU policies, US policies may hurt Erdogan's economic basis. The money flooding from Qatar may, may be restricted, limited, shrunk by Qataris that may hurt him. And then, but overall, I'm very pessimistic about the possibility of a power change in Turkey. Uh, Erdogan is a very smart guy, and he, he, he always look at the coming trends. For example, there was a nationalist trend coming, and he, I was expecting him to be damaged by this wave of Turkish nationalism, but instead he led it, he became prominent Turkish nationalist in discourse. In reality, he's not, because in reality he has no basic backbone, a basic ideological consistent set of views. He's very pragmatic, opportunistic. So now, for example, I'm expecting a secular wave, a secular backlash, but he seemed to be prepared even for that, returning to Kemalism, referring to Atatürk. So a very smart person looking the opinion polls and has no limitation whatsoever to use any discourse, any means. And in the Turkish political fabric, there is no actor who can at this point challenge him. The only factor, I think I want to say two things. One is economy again which matters, obviously, we are human beings having stomach and material needs, but obviously even in, if we have an economic crisis, he finds scapegoats, reproduce excuses, blame someone in the party, he may get rid of this. But in the long run, what I think is that I know AKP people many of my friends and family members, etc., political level, at the basic level, they are losing morality. Turkey right now is under 
a very unprecedented ethical crisis. If we consider the issue of corruption, Reza Zarrab case, the basic line is that the political morality is totally gone, and which is surprising and disappointing and heartbreaking for me, which is happening with a constituency which claims to be very moral because of certain religious and nationalistic views. They consider themselves moral people, but they don't consider morality at all when it comes to support a political leader. In the very long run, there may be a certain level of free thinking, morality, consciousness at the very dear heart of the AKP constituency, then we may be hopeful about the future of Turkey. Until that point comes, I think this regime is very well established. It's not easy to challenge it. Thank you very much. And Icon, in, in sort of directing the question to you, I want to pick up on something that Ahmed was saying, that elections don't matter. And so as we have sort of uh, members of the opposition or the electoral opposition or representatives of them, um, does the opposition pose any uh, sort of challenge for Erdogan and the AKP? Or are other challenges much more, uh, much more worrisome for him? I think the opposition uh, and the ballot box <clears throat> are necessary evils for Erdogan. <clears throat> Uh, and his key strategy is also his key weakness, because his key strategy has been to criminalize the opposition. It has worked very well with the HDP. Um, Co-leaders, legislators, mayors, city councillors, party officials jailed. Now uh, the second uh, stage is the CHP. Uh, we already have one of the former deputy chairs of CHP in prison. He is being now tried uh, for treason, which can bring life in jail. Uh, just a couple of days ago, Erdogan indicted the whole 60-seat party council, CHP's uh, governing council. Uh, so now he might, if, if he follows the same path as the HDP, CHP might be en masse criminalized. And I am, I think, now Exhibit A here, because those of you who have been following the news, as of last Tuesday, a couple of hours before US versus Mehmet Hakan Attila, AKA Reza Zarab case kicked off, and a couple of hours before the CHP leader Kılıçdaroğlu was to announce uh, Erdogan extended families offshore accounts, uh, Istanbul prosecutor's office issued an arrest warrant against me arguing that uh, I was a witness at the Mehmet Hakan Attila trial and that I was guilty of providing a fake document to the New York Southern District Prosecutor's Office. Now, I think this is Erdogan's main challenge, meaning he <coughs> needs to criminalize the opposition, uh, but at this point he can only do it in a farcical, in a Kafkaesque way, that is, uh, you know, unlike in Turkey, in, in US courts are extremely transparent. If you are willing to pay a couple of cents, you can check all the court documents. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, Istanbul prosecutor's office is certainly capable of checking the, the witness list. I'm not there. And it, even if I were there, uh, even under Turkey's state of emergency, being called a witness to a trial is not a criminal offense. Uh, and so, I, I think the, the key challenge is this. What do you do in a democracy that's just a ballot box where all the major players are criminalized? For example, just a couple of days ago, again, one of the AKP legislators said, we should raid the house of Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, the CHP leader, and confiscate all of its belongings to you know, look for clues of, I guess, treason. Now, sure, Erdogan can do it meaning uh, he can continue to criminalize my other colleagues. You know, there are still a few who haven't been indicted. Uh, but then ultimately, when it comes to 2019 or early elections, he will need to play this game with us. He's doing the same thing with E-Party, the good party too. You know, there are uh, accusations of E-Party being a front for what Turk Turkey calls Fethullahi's terrorist organization, FETÖ. So if E-Party is, too is criminal, if CHP and HDP are both criminal, um, it really is a poor game to play if your only counterpart is Devlet Bahçeli. 
So that, I think, is the main challenge. Meaning, how will Turkey, or how will Erdogan, uh, retain the semblance of even competitive authoritarianism? Because competitive authoritarianism at least requires an iota of possibility that the opposition could win the elections, as we have seen with the June 2015 elections, even if it doesn't mean change of power, even if it means a, a bloody campaign and snap elections and uh, the one-man ruler regaining power. But it, even that semblance is necessary, you know? But I think uh, in the run-up to 2019, we might not have that, because there are these two diametrically opposite trends. They're very, both very strong trends. One is keeping the illusion going that Turkey is not a dictatorship. Turkey is not one man rule. But at the same time, there is a very strong push for criminalization, because that's what uh, ensures the survival of the regime, survival of, of, a, of a ruler who has no exit strategy. Uh, my prediction is, it's quite difficult to predict anything these days in Turkey, um, but we will continue to, in the run-up to the elections, um, live in a progressively toxic environment, what I call a post-truth environment, where in, not only individuals like me, who are you know, Turkish, Sunni, you know, middle class, mainstream, from an urban center, uh, but all of Turkey is vulnerable individuals, Kurds, you know, Alevis, atheists, LGBTI individuals, you know, leftists, environmentalists, they will all be smeared uh, and, and scapegoated and in intimidated. And uh, civil society too, not just the political parties, as we see with Osman Kavala, uh, who's a very symbolic name, civil society will too be intimidated, but then I guess in the last three months, in the run-up to the elections, Erdogan has to come up with a, no matter how wrecked, no matter how imprisoned, tortured, exiled, whatever, he has to come up with some sort of opposition-like looking uh, actors so that there can be a ballot box at the end of this, so that he can show, look, I was not the only candidate. Look, there are other parties. Look, there are a few other candidates besides Devlet Bahçeli. Uh, that I'm waiting to see. And, and my prediction is, again, coming back to my, uh, he, he will need it. Meaning no matter how uh, strongly Erdogan cracks down on the opposition, he will need to find elements among the opposition parties and movements who are more desirable? Now, this is the sinister conclusion I have, and they exist. Maybe this is hopeful for Turkey's competitive authoritarianism to, to maintain the image, because there are always individuals in various political factions who might be willing to play the, what we call the neo-nationalist game, the, the hardliner game, prone to conspiracy theories, you know, who might say, you know what? Yes, you know, Erdogan is not the best individual out there, but there is a global conspiracy. You know, there is a, there is a global cabal, interest lobby. They're trying to undermine the US, the EU, Germans, Americans, aliens. So th there are people who are willing to buy that, and uh, I think we will see that farce uh, in play. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, I want to turn back uh, to Giran and to Gunesh because uh, I want to turn to the Kurdish, Kurdish question, but I want to do so by picking up on Icon's point about how the AKP and Erdogan, uh, if we sort of consider this uh, coming all from his direction, has used criminalization as a strategy of trying to marginalize the opposition. Um, I've written a lot about sort of rhetorical vilification and name calling and shaming and, and all those sorts of things. Um, but obviously, you know, the, the jailing of the, the two co-chairs of the People's Democratic Party, of many mayors and, and other members and so forth. Um, but we see this criminalization, I think, often as a kind of a, a backlash against someone or some actor that Erdogan fears, feels has betrayed him. Um, you know, the, there was this coalition or this sort of understanding that the, the Kurds and, and the AKP would partner together and potentially the Kurds would get some sort of, um, you know, cultural or, or other kinds of rights would be given to them um, and that they would support the presidential project. So if that is the response that they've seen once they no longer agree, 
agree to support that. Um, what, if anything, could the Kurdish movement, speaking of you know, coming from the PKK, um, coming from the People's Democratic Party, what could they have done differently? Should they have entered into that sort of dangerous coalition? Um, was there anything that they could have done differently to prevent the, the scene that we see now? Gunesh? Okay, I mean, obviously I can't speak on behalf of PKK, but I can just basically make some uh, observations. As, as expert scholars. of yeah. the Kurdish movement. <laughs> so, but I mean, let me just basically tell something which I disagree with both Icon and uh, uh, Ahmed. And it's more like a friendly disagreement, but I mean, I get the impression that we live in a country in which there's a master of puppets, and this basic master basically decides on everything. Well, I mean, this is just basically a complete, I think, underestimation the resilience of social movements and mass mobilization in Turkey. I mean, well, Obviously, Turkey is part of the Middle East, and in Middle Eastern countries, you don't basically see much mass mobilization capacity, maybe except obviously with the exception of Arab uprisings. But in Turkey, I mean, if you look at more closely, if you just basically go beyond uh, maybe the marble circles of like the, the Ankara, you basically see a very vibrant, very active society. And just basically just a couple of days ago, the hunger striker, Nuria Gülmen, mm -hmm. she was in prison for many months. And this is basically, I think, more than 270 days through which she has been on hunger strike. Government basically tried to portray him as a terrorist. They basically put her in prison, mm -hmm. but it didn't work out because the society did not buy it. What I try to say is, of course, I mean, there's a very strong authoritarian tendency, but at the same time, there's a very strong resilience of the society. I think it is very important to emphasize that because otherwise you get the impression that there's a one guy who basically decides everything and then everything depends on what he basically thinks uh, when he wakes up. Mm -hmm. But it is not that simple. It's much more complicated story. And coming back to your story, sorry, your question, so if you are basically the Kurdish movement, and obviously Kurdish movement has many different faces. One is like armed, um, like the movement, the PKK, and obviously uh, the, the, the electoral parties. I mean, one thing always important to keep out the PKK is that these guys have been around for a long time. So they're basically long, their time perception is very long, which basically means that, I mean, what, whatever you basically think about their calculations do not always reflect what they basically want to achieve. That because their primary goal is to stay and survive, which has been very successful under very like a <laughs> repressive and difficult conditions for the more than last 40 years. And for this reason, as long as they survive, as long as they have basically people willing to fight for the insurgency, then they can basically just like always have an opportunity to make any kind of deal or negotiations. And this is just important to keep in mind. I mean, yes, you can make the argument that what happened in 2013 to 15 was more like a missed opportunity. But I'm not sure about that because I was very skeptical about that to start with. But then, I mean, what are they going to do? They're, they cannot fight like until the end of the uh, world. I mean, at some point, they need to make some kind of compromises. They need to find a Turkish government which is willing to make compromises. And they thought that, especially through the Abdul Öcalan, the Erdogan is willing to give them some uh, small concessions. I mean, obviously, it didn't work out. But as long as the insurgency is over there, as long as they have the power, as long as there are people willing to kill and fight for the insurgency, they always have a leverage. I mean, now Turkey managed to con some of contains insurgency. If you look at uh, what happened throughout this year in terms of how many people get killed and how many attacks the PKK was able to uh, stage, but as long as, again, it's a kind of a feasible insurgency, it is always going to like, stay there. It's always created some issues, problems for the Turkish governments. And before the presidential system, my view is that the best, maybe the most optimistic way for the Kurdish movement to be getting some real concessions and then basically being maybe like uh, less violent in the long run is basically being part of a coalition government. Mm -hmm. And there was a real possibility like in the June of 2015 after the first round of elections. But always Erdogan did like, like this possibility. <coughs> but now with the new presidential system, there is no such possibility because there will be only one president and then he will basically decide on the old executive board. But still you can basically have some kind of legislative uh, presence in the parliament, which basically give, some, give you some leverage. But then again, it is basically more like worse than what used to be the parliamentary case system because then you have more like opportunities, more possibilities for being part of a coalition government. I mean, can you imagine like a Kurdish guy being the interior minister or justice minister? It basically sounds very difficult nowadays, but I mean, there were some kind of a real possibilities for Kurdish people or Kurdish politicians become ministers as long as this peace process went through. And it didn't, obviously. Uh, I mean, I can basically make more comments about like the, the referendum and then the PYD and the Roja, but maybe we can just keep it like for the next round, so. Thank you. Do you know? um, I mean, the first thing I'd like to specify is that <clears throat> the, criminal, the criminalization of uh, the, the Kurdish cause in Turkey didn't start with Erdogan, um, obviously. Um, this goes back a long time and uh, the HDP comes from a political tradition where 
Uh, in the 90s, its members of parliament, its activists were killed on the streets in Turkey. Extrajudicial killings, I'm sure everyone knows. This is the tradition uh, or the backdrop uh, for the People's Democratic Party. And so uh, I think that's important to specify, firstly. Uh, secondly, with the, gr the, gram the grammatic correction that we had in the beginning, the, the HDP is the People's Democratic Party of all the peoples in Turkey. Yes, in a lot of places, um, I mean, it definitely has a pro-Kurdish element, but it's not just a pro-Kurdish party. Um, it's a, a progressive party for, the, for all the peoples of Turkey, for LGBTI uh, individuals, for that resistance, for other ethnicities that live in Turkey, uh, for the laborers and workers of Turkey. So I think once uh, we define the HDP in that way, uh, yes, the peace process was a huge opportunity for Turkey, and uh, the HDP more than played its part during this time. Um, but when we came towards uh, the end of that process, uh, the choice was between, yes, all right, there was a possibility for Turkey's Kurdish question uh, to be solved. A lot of people don't even believe that, but there was a process, there was dialogue. Um, the leader of the PKK from his prison cell was able to send letters to Nevroz celebrations that were attended by hundreds of thousands, if not millions, and this is unprecedented in Turkey. So um, I don't want to say that there was nothing at all. There was, there was a serious process going on. Um, but again, when I first said that election arithmetics kind of determined the outcome, of that process. Now, what could the HDP have done differently? Uh, well, what the HDP did do, firstly, was that um, it prioritized the democratization of Turkey more than anything else. Now, at one point, uh, there was the, the, the platform where, yes, the Kurdish question could be solved, but at what expense? Uh, Erdogan uh, wanted certain backing for his agenda. Um, but could the HDP have ever pursued a process whereby, yes, the Kurdish question would be solved, but Turkey would be in a far worse situation democratically? Um, I don't think the HDP could have put itself through something like that, could have invested uh, into that kind of process. And um, yes, Erdogan may have seen that as a betrayal, but at the end of the day, the, the, the question came down to, we can make an agreement with the Kurdish population. We could uh, extend certain freedoms, cultural freedoms for the Kurds in Turkey. But um, from Erdogan's perspective, this was about how much the Kurds would then back his uh, agenda of consolidating all the institutions, all the power in his person. Um, and I think the HDP made the choice. The, uh, the, deterior the, de deter the deterioration of democracy in Turkey would not benefit any of the peoples in the country. Um, and so, I mean, to be honest, even the PKK was saying this. Uh, theoretically, in all of its statements, the PKK talks about the democratization of Turkey. Um, so in that kind of atmosphere, yes, maybe a lot of Kurds uh, would, uh, could possibly have thought, well, let's just solve our issue. Let's not care what, what happens to Turkey afterwards. But when it came down to uh, this process, the Kurdish question uh, for a lot of Kurds is tied in with the level of democracy in the whole of Turkey. So the two can't be separated from each other. And uh, in the final analysis, this is what the HDP decided on. The, uh, the solution of the Kurdish question is ontologically tied in with Turkey's standard of democracy. And with Erdogan, that's taken a rapid nosedive. Uh, and um, that's why the HDP, yes, maybe um, the only difference that it the, the HDP or Salat in Demirtas after the June 7 elections may or should have been maybe. I mean, a lot of people criticized the HDP for not being open to a coalition with the AKP. That because of that closeness, uh, the AKP had had to turn to the MHP, which I personally don't agree with. 
Um, maybe that could have been done differently. If the HDP, if Selatin Demirtas had come out straight after the election and said, uh, we are open to working with the AKP, we are open to uh, being in a coalition of some sort with Erdogan, then some things may have turned out differently. Um, but I think the HDP uh, ultimately decided that that the deterioration of democracy in Turkey wouldn't benefit any of the peoples, not just the Kurdish people. And that's why um, the divergence in uh, the HDP's approach to the peace process, uh, but also actually the PKK's too. Uh, I think that's important to specify. Yes, none of us are going to be able to talk on behalf of the PKK, but even the PKK's approach during that time was to prioritize uh, the situation in Turkey generally, because okay. I think they agreed that the two can't be separated from each other. Excellent. Sorry to sort of wrap you up a little bit, but I want to then turn the question over um, to, in, from a little bit of a different direction, to Ahmed. Um, so Gudan had sort of talked about the HDP as this big tent party uh, that is not just, you know, pro-Kurdish. It's supporting a lot of other interests. Obviously, we saw the AKP is presenting itself as a big tent party um, and welcoming another uh, section of the population that had been oppressed, that is, uh, pious Muslims. To what extent do you think that Islam is still important for the AKP, either as an ideology, as a pure tool of election mobilization? Do we see the policies that the AKP is putting through, such as education reform and so forth, sort of to cater to a population or to actually construct a population that they would like to see in the future? Thank you for the question. Let me. Uh, bring these two issues together by another friendly disagreement. Mm -hmm. Starting with the first issue, the, re the, the fact that two hunger strikers were released, excellent, wonderful, we celebrate, but it wasn't a result of social resistance. It was a result of regime's policy that make it something mentioned in this conference that good things happening in Turkey. And it's an achievement of the regime that we are talking it as a positive thing happening in Turkey. No, positive things are not happening in Turkey. There is no strong civil society in Turkey. 5,000 academics were sacked. 150,000 employees were sacked. Why would you say there's no strong civil society in Turkey? I'll explain it. Mm -hmm. 50,000 people are in jail for political reasons, for mostly being blamed as Gulenists. Over 20,000 women are in jail and about half of them, I don't know the exact number, are housewives. And 660 of them have babies under age of six in jail. Where is the strong civil society criticizing, protesting the fact that 660 babies are in jail? So this is my disagreement. The second thing about the Kurdish issue, I think we are underestimating what Erdogan did against Kurds. Turkish military never attacked Kurdish towns with tanks and artilleries before. That's unprecedented. That's happening first time. That cannot comparable with the previous killing and torturing, etc. This, this is even symbolically really first time happening in Turkey. And then criticizing Demirtas for not call, having a coalition agreement with Erdogan is totally wrong because we have to understand the Erdogan phenomena. And I think the best thing Selahattin Demirtas did was to refuse to have any political collaboration with Erdogan. And it was the right choice because as John mentioned that the future of Kurds is directly linked to the future of democracy in Turkey. <coughs> if Demirtas compromised, it would be against the whole idea of establishing a democratic Turkey. So let me bring to your question and my first insight about the issue of morality. As well as I understand, more than half of Erdogan's constituency, which means more than 25% of Turkish voters, are Islamic conservatives. Mm -hmm. Islam is important, Islamism is important, and Erdogan makes these two almost the same thing, Islam, Islamism. The boundary is extremely blurry these days in Turkey. The educational system already Islamized. There is strong emphasis on Imam Hatip schools. Even the Turkish police, we have seen videos in the YouTube, the Turkish police are taking an oath 
or referring to Quran and Allah and Islam, etc. And AKP people share these videos celebrating. And then when they hear me criticizing, they will say, oh, you are an apostate, you are no longer a Muslim. What kind of secular state is this? My, ex my expertise is secularism. I encourage Turkey to take the US path, passive secularism, rather than the French assertive secularism. And I am very much disappointed to see that Turkey t is taking an Islamist populist path. Mm -hmm. So the only hope for the future is that this 25% pro-Islamic conservatives, and it's expanding, maybe now it's more than that, one day realize that what they are doing is totally against any idea of morality. If the Kurdish towns are bombed, if hundreds of babies are in jail, there should be some level of ethical principle and ethical concern among these pro-Islamic, Islamic conservative constituents of Erdogan rather than simply worshiping and following a strong man. So then do you see it more as sort of a strategic tool, something that's not necessarily genuine, or do you see it as sort of a, a basic misunderstanding of the principles of Islam? Or? For, yeah, for Erdogan, it's a political tool and instrument. Mm -hmm. For the people I'm referring to Islamic conservatives, it's a genuine thing. But uh, the understanding of Islam is a more and more becoming a political Islam, mm -hmm. rather than Sufism, mysticism, worshiping, having private religious life, because the whole discourse is a assertiveness in foreign policy, aggressiveness at home, having a strong state, mm -hmm. And this regime is more dangerous than Kemalism because Kemalism did not have religious legitimacy, never claim that the opposi opposition is infidel. The, the Kemalism was an authoritarian regime I criticized for many years. But right now there is a regime in construction which combined the old Ottoman understanding of raison d'etat with the classical Islamic view that the apostate should be killed. And then the combination is very strong, very dangerous, and it will take maybe generations to really face this challenge. Okay, so in thinking about how to face this challenge before we turn it over to the audience, because I know you're bringing, brimming with questions. Um, Icon, I wanna ask you about the possibility of potential coalitions, um, whether the, these are early elections or whether they're held in 2019. Um, thinking about the outreaches that Erdogan has made to the nationalists, um, thank you. Um, the role of, of Islam, of, of purges, of Kurds, what potential, we talked a little bit about the EE party, um, what potential do you see of maybe like a CHP E party coalition or what, what potential coalitions might we see? Yeah, that, that's the, the million dollar question, meaning if there is going to be democratic transition in Turkey, what would that exactly. government look like? Uh, now, when we take a look at the polls today, and I have to warn you that the polls probably don't mean much as a tool to predict what might happen in 29, because we might be in a completely different political environment. We might have even greater repression beyond our imagination. We might end up having kind of, uh, not only the HDP, but CHP without basically its top cadres. But let's assume that uh, Erdogan uh, slows down a bit because he desperately needs some political actors to compete against and he allows parties to run. Um, based on the polls we now have, uh, we, the, the challenge is this. Uh, CHP plus E party, which I would call in the good old German sense maybe a grand coalition, mm -hmm. You know, an E party that's trying to move a far right party to a center right position, and you know, CHP representing the, the center and center left, that could be a grand coalition uh, to restore some, I will pick my words very carefully, sanity, just sanity. I, I don't have great expectations. Just restore some sanity to Turkish politics. But unfortunately, the numbers come short. Meaning, um, uh, in, in a four-party parliament, you know, with HDP and the AKP, uh, we end up with June 2015 scenario. 
Uh, why? Because Turkey's key challenge is uh, to, of course, bring in the Kurds. Because ultimately, <clears throat> um, the challenge back in June was how to deal with a CHP, MHP, HDP majority. Three parties that can never come together. You know, CHP is the wild card here. People can contemplate a CHP, MHP, or a CHP, HDP coalition. Similarly, in this case, again, in 2019, people can contemplate a CHP E party or CHP HDP coalition, but neither of those options give you a majority. And because of Turkey's deep run cleavages, uh, it's beyond, I guess, today's imagination that the three parties can come together. So this happens to be Erdogan's main advantage, uh, that Turkey is not only divided by you know, class and rural urban, but also by ethnicity and sect. Uh, and unless we see, I don't know how, but a, a great exodus to the center, meaning to a center-right E party and a center-left CHP, that can give a majority, which is not only matched in the parliamentary election, but also in the, the presidential election, uh, it's very difficult to imagine a transition. And let me end, allow me to end with a caveat. Even in my grand coalition scenario, there's still the challenge because almost 90% of the Kurdish electorate would be out of such a grand coalition mm -hmm. between CHP and E party. You know, E party probably has extremely little Kurdish representation. CHP has some, but not enough. So if when you leave the AKP and the HDP out of a grand coalition, unintendedly, you're basically leaving out 90% of the Kurdish electorate. So these are some of the, let me say, um, the Gordian knots of Turkish politics that end up pushing Turkey further and further into one-man rule and a Kafkaesque kind of darkness. Excellent, thank you. So but before we sort of transition to the uh, question and answer period, um, for which we would like uh, you, if you have a question, to please come to the mic. Um, there's a couple of mics in the aisles here if you want to ask a question. While people are doing that, uh, I'll fill the time by uh, turning to my panelists on my right to respond to Ahmed's point that there's sort of a very weak civil society in Turkey, because that's something that, that strikes me. Um, a lot of pol political scientists will point to the different divisions in Turkey to say why there's a weak civil society. We can look at the repression of the the leftists of in the 1980 coup. Um, do you agree that there's a very weak civil society in Turkey? And if not, what might we see as the strong elements pushing it forward? I mean, obviously, completely disagree with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can only say that obviously, yes, there's too much repression in Turkey, but it doesn't mean that there is no robust civil mobilization capacity in Turkey. These are very two different things. And I mean, but obviously, you also need to put things in like perspective and context, because I mean, very simplistic reading will be, okay, say, Erdogan was very liberal, he was darling of the European Union, he basically made all this deal, he basically really improved Turkish economy until, let's say, 2011, 2012, and then gradually became this kind of boogeyman that now everybody's afraid of. Well, I mean, come on, this is, doesn't, it doesn't basically help you to understand the complexities and the nuance of Turkish politics mm -hmm. because you can make the argument that history basically lurches back and forward sometimes simultaneously. I mean, coming back to this issue, even if Erdogan becomes like, show his like, strong authoritarian tendencies by 2012 or 2013, he also basically initiated this Kurdish initiative, which was basically maybe the most ambitious project by the Turkish governments to try to resolve the most important issue in the entire Turkish Republic. Right, so, but that's, those are top-down initiatives in terms of bottom-up initiatives yeah. and the strength of civil society. But yeah, again, I mean, like, Coming back to the, maybe the Icons party, mm -hmm. well, you can basically say lots of things about the Kılıçdaroğlu, Terol, but he's the guy who basically probably around 70 years old, and correct me if I am wrong, he basically walked for more than 300 miles, like just a couple of months like from Ankara to Istanbul. Mm -hmm. I mean, so if you look at basically the country's potential for opposition, it is there. I mean, the question always, there is too much repression going on. I mean, they, I, I don't disagree with that. But I mean, it is also very important not to give the impression that there's only a single person in Turkey and his decisions make the ultimate like, choice. But I mean, there's lots of constraints and restraints under which he operates. 
And you also need to think about like what happened obviously in July 15 of 2016 mm -hmm. in the sense that, I mean, okay, we talk about all this suppression, but then, I mean, unfortunately, there is this like huge attempt by certain forces in the Turkish army, which basically tried to take over the country, which basically resulted in the massacres of like more than 200 people in the cities of Turkey, mm -hmm. not only in the Kurdish areas before that and after that, but I mean, basically in the midst of Istanbul and Ankara. I mean, if you think about that, I mean, yes, if you, Erdogan has all this political responsibility for what's going on in Turkey, mm -hmm. but there are many other actors with basically like agencies and political sure. capacities which basically also like really have lots of influence in what is going on in Turkey. Okay, very briefly before we go to the audience, Kiran, um, particularly during Gezi, there was a, a you know consideration that maybe the the left in the Kurdish movement and the left in the the CHP might be able to come together. Is that sort of off the table, or are there other actors that could fill that? I I'd never like to say that that's completely off the table. I mean, I don't want to think that. Mm -hmm. um, but you just talked about Gezi, and I think maybe with this issue, I'm going to sit on the fence a little bit. But I think if, when you look at Gezi and what brought so many people onto the streets throughout the country, uh, when you look back at 2012, 2013, and what the situation was about, you know, a park with mm -hmm. in Taksim, um, and if you look at the situation now, we are in such a worse time, but yet uh, nothing like Gezi is happening. Right. So I, I think I might tend towards our, our argument that, yeah, civil that's society... that's a weak civil society it, question? That's taken a huge hit. It's taken a huge hit. I think we have to accept that. But I, obviously I would never say that uh, civil society is no longer a, a force in Turkey. Um, and I don't think that's what I'm saying as well. But uh, I just want to add here that after Gezi, mm -hmm. the Kurds were at Gezi. Mm -hmm. um, the HDP was at Gezi from the beginning. Uh, but I think with the Kurdish side of things, there's a huge disappointment that while in the West, uh, when there is an uprising, the, the Kurds are always there. But when something happens in the east of Turkey, when cities are being completely destroyed, when thousands of people are being killed when mothers and babies have been on the streets for days uh, after being shot by Turkish security services, why is something not happening in the West? And I think that creates a huge disappointment. In the disappointment. West of Turkey? In the in West, West of Turkey, mm -hmm. sorry, yeah. And that creates a huge disappointment amongst the Kurdish population. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, that... Because one does... can say that about the West in general. But... It, well, uh, yeah. That gets that to the definitely. foreign policy panel. Okay. Exactly, yeah. Excellent, so, yeah. all right. Great, thank you very much. So I want to start to um, take some questions from the audience. Uh, again, please do come up to the mics. Please introduce yourself. Please keep your question very brief. Uh, questions, not comments. Um, yes, let's start with you, please. And please direct your question to a member of the panel. Um, I have two questions, and one is to uh, Mr. Ozjan, and um, I want to know if uh, he, he kind of alluded to it. I traveled in Mardin a few years ago, and the situation was very hopeful. People were, the Kurdish population was really, really excited about participating in the democratic process. And then there was a, a quick downturn. And I want to know if you know where, if there's one point at which that occurred. So for example, one theory is that when the um, Kurdish, part, well, when the HDP did not um, uh, join the coalition. That's when, you know, it was sort of the end of the game at that point. So I want to know if you can identify what might have caused this sudden shift from being positive to really being anti uh, the Kurdish region. And the second question I have is, um, maybe uh, Professor Kuru could answer this. Do, does he think that there's um, any effect of uh, the um, television series, for example, this Dirilish Erdogan television series, which is now available on Netflix, that really romanticizes uh, the, uh, you know, the pre-Ottoman and the Ottomans and Islam and, and the righteousness of Islam. And um, if there's any you know, sort of uh, plan or if this is some kind of plan to sort of build up that kind of feeling within the Turkish population. Okay. Thank you. Let's take a couple questions, actually, so we can have our panelists uh, deliberate uh, and then kind of bring them all together. Yes, sir, please uh, please introduce is, yourself. My name is Erdo Ankman with Silk Road, which is a data aggregator on Turkey based in Washington, D.C. It is very difficult to ask questions to a panel of Cassandras, but I have only one question. Can you answer what major rights were denied to Kurds under the AK Parti regime that garnered more Kurdish votes than any other party in Turkey, and appointed many, many ministers of Kurdish origin. 
And another question here. Mustafa Malik is my name. <clears throat> I also have two questions. One is general, that do you expect Turkey to have a democratic civil society overnight? After 600 years of authoritarian rule and then under Kamalis, there was an election. And in all Western democracies, they took hundreds of years. And all elections so far have been held, people overwhelmingly vote for the AKP. So how do you think overnight it can transform into democracy? And second question is about the coup. <clears throat> When I was there, I researched in Turkey for several years that I saw Fatullah Gulen's supporters in all levels of society, the police, judiciary, bureaucracy. And after the coup happened, and everybody was, I think 90% of Turks believe the CIA was involved. After 90% of the Turks believe, and they have the names, and there is no concern among the opposition about the coup. For the first time in Turkish, it's the people in the street that defeated the coup. So how do you resolve the coup questions, get into the bottom of it? And widespread arrest, how do you come to grips with the people when the Gulen's supporters at all levels of society? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I think very briefly, Giran, because we, we've talked a little bit about what the turning points in the, the Kurdish movement uh, and sort of how things went went south. You want to just briefly respond to that very quickly? Uh, yeah, just briefly then. Um, I think one the main turning point was probably the April 5th date, where the last meeting with Öcalan occurred, uh, who uh, at, at that time the process was being, uh, I mean, he, he was managing the process from one side. And on April, the 5th of April, when um, PKK fighters were slowly withdrawing under, uh, I mean, Erdogan's direction, um, on April the 5th, I think polls were going to Erdogan, showing that that peace process was just not having the impact he probably wished for when it came to uh, the polls. And um, April 5th was a huge turning point. Yes, there was a huge uh, hope uh, but that April 5th date is very important. That's when Erdogan decided that uh, this peace process isn't having the impact that I'm going for here and that it, it will be terminated from now. And that's when he did not accept there were some agreements being made. Uh, the PKK wanted certain guarantees that once it withdrew that the fighting wouldn't uh, be you know, started again, that the, its fighters could safely withdraw into outside of uh, Turkey's borders. But when Erdogan said that this agreement, I, I reject this agreement, he said this openly, he even criticized his own ministers for actually being a party to such, such an agreement. And uh, yeah, uh, June 7 elections then were the manifestation of what Erdogan was seeing in the polls. And so that, for me, that April 5th day is uh, definitely the main turning point. Thank you very much. Ahmed, I'm someone who's fascinated in the interaction of pop culture and politics and how you know shows can be used by the regime to create particular citizens and how they can be used by the opposition. How would you respond to that question yeah. about the soap operas? When I was in Qatar, Arabs watching Turkish soap mm -hmm. operas, but it's mostly about romance, not, not about neo-Ottomanism because they don't like Ottoman that much. But I think the current TV series and previously the Gulen affiliated STV had some series about nationalism, these are all very negative things and complicated further Turkish Kurdish question then romanticize the past which really didn't take place that in that context and this is very problematic and also I refer to Islamic conservative bases in Turkey expanding that's true propaganda through TV series through political discourse it's creating a fantasy uh, Ottoman in Wonderland. Unfortunately, that's going on. And the Kemalists, I think, are unable to provide a really deep discourse to challenge it. When it comes to anti-Westernism, they even feel the anti-Westernism. It's surprising how various ideological group people coming together when it comes to anti-US, anti-American conspiracy. So I've been 
living in the US for 20 years, for a regular Kurd in any ideological background, I would easily be defined as a spy. And my talk today is very much an American conspiracy for most of the Turks. It's really unfortunate, because I'm not. I'm not an American spy. So you, you can laugh. If That's you what they would say, though. OK. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm supposed to be. I'm paid for that, yeah. So then the second question about the Kurdish ministers in the AKP, but they are, they are kind of taken and there have always been Kurds in Turkish politics. Abdurkadir Aksu, the one of the most famous Turkish politicians, is unapologetically, explicitly Kurdish figure. So it's not really something very progressive for AKP, having Kurds in politics. It's really a constant in Turkish politics. The last thing about the overnight change, it's not overnight, Turkey has a very long history of parliamentary regime. 1877 was the first Ottoman parliament, 60% Muslim, 40% Christian and Jews. That's the first really, truly multi-religious parliament in the world whatsoever. Even today, it's really difficult to find such a complex parliament. Then 1908, Christians already gone, having their own independent states, and some massacres as 1908. Then still, 55% Turkish, 45% other ethnic groups, ethnically very diverse parliament. Then 1950, we had the election. So uh, Turkey, if so I have already said negative things, and let me conclude with a positive one. Turkey has a great history of parliamentary and participatory politics. That's why I am di di deeply disappointed, that I cannot accept that the current situation is very similar to some other third world countries which no such history whatsoever. Okay, before I take the, the question about the rights that have or have not been given to the Kurds, I want to sort of move this question of the speed of which we can expect democratic transition or should expect or should not expect democratic transition in Turkey to ICON. Um, so we have institutional uh, history with and experience with democracy in Turkey. Um, so how would you respond to the question of how can we expect this to happen overnight? I think the key issue is let's keep our eye on the trajectory. That is, is Turkey moving toward rule of law? due process, pluralism, democracy, social inclusion, or is Turkey descending into authoritarianism, crony capitalism, one-man rule? Um, and if that is our kind of guiding light, I think the answer is simple. Uh, the, the, the demand here is not overnight democratization of Turkey. The demand here is Turkey, at certain periods, was moving towards what I would consider the right target, you know, um, as expressed maybe in the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, and there are other periods, such as this one, uh, where Turkey is descending into a really a, a brutal, bloody darkness. And it's as simple as that. So the, I think the goal, the, the, the key challenge for us is not to find benchmarks like Iran or North Korea, which will always make Turkey look better. You can always say, oh, compared to some others, Syria, Turkey's doing okay. Because the best years of Turkish history, Turkish Republican history, uh, are those years when we had high benchmarks, when we looked at the EU acquis, when we looked at uh, the European Court of Human Rights this decisions, when we looked at convergence with the EU uh, standards. So if we start looking at you know, Syria, Russia, you know, uh, Iran, North Korea, China as benchmark, that's horrible. Plus, if we look at earlier periods of Turkish history, yes, we can legitimate anything. We can always say, oh, there were extrajudicial executions, there were massacres, there was torture, uh, parties were banned. Yes, are we any better than that today? I hope so. Why? Because. The challenge is a particularly, the, the race is a particularly tough one right now because the, the, the world is not staying still. I know there's a rise in right-wing populism here and there, but the issue is this. Take a look at the world. Per capita income is rising. Average years of schooling rising. Uh, a lot of uh, people in absolute poverty are being brought out of absolute poverty. So 
in this fast-paced earth, in today's world, Turkey needs to pick up steam. Turkey is... Okay, so the point is that Turkey needs to move forward, but we can't necessarily expect it to do so immediately. And I think the point about no, benchmarks is important, right? It's, it's about incrementalism, right. meaning I think if we emphasize overnight reform, okay. we are destroying the, the real task. The real task is incremental, step by step. Are we moving forward or right. back? Excellent, thank you. And then really quickly on this question of what are the rights that the Kurds have not been given, or what are those that, that have been uh, sort of contentious? Um, really quickly, uh, Gunesh and then Giran. So does anyone know who among all the leaders in the Middle East give most generous agreement to the Kurdish movement in history? Bashar al-Assad? No, Saddam. Hmm. Saddam in 1970 in Iraq. I mean, this can be an interesting analogy, but what I try to say is that it is always basically you can make the argument, okay, we gave this curse to this, and then we gave curse to that, but I mean, ultimately, it doesn't change the fact that what I find very interesting, well, there are millions of people who vote for a Kurdish nationalist party, hmm. And then there are tens of thousands of people from the Kurdish areas of Turkey who basically risk their lives and basically would like join insurgents to, to kill, kill uh, Turkish soldiers. I mean, so it basically means that obviously from these people's perspective, the AKP's government, basically Kurdish policy has not been very satisfactory. And then the other thing uh, for a uh, gentleman from, from the Silk uh, Way, I guess, well, it is not historically accurate to say that there's a huge increase in the number of ministers, Kurdish ministers in the AKP government. I actually did a study as a scholar about that, which basically goes back for ministers until 1980, and for governors goes back until 1950. And when you look at the actual numbers, and I'm talking about like thousands of bureaucrats and ministers, well, there is no real increase in the number of Kurdish origin ministers in the AKP governments. I mean, it is basically uh, very similar to what was the case in the 1990s, for example. So I mean, when you look at the numbers, no, you don't basically see a huge uh, increase. And last point is that, I mean, yes, obviously the, the AKP government has lots of Kurdish initiatives with some real gains, but then look at what, about, what happened in the last two years. Yeah. Many of these gains are already lost. I mean, now people can't even speak Kurdish in prison. Right. They can't even basically write Kurdish letters. Yeah. So. Okay, excellent, thank you. Good on. Um, just very shortly, I just wanna say, just want to say, I mean, AKP bashing, we're at a very, you know, it's very easy to be, uh, and we can all sit here and just bash the AKP. It's very, that's very easy right now. And w we do have to accept that, yes, in 2002, there were certain initiatives, but I think the gentleman might be forgetting, um, I mean, that only comes up to a stage where if the Kurds are, like in 2009, score uh, an election success, uh, I think uh, the gentleman might be forgetting the there's a very significant photo of uh, handcuffed uh, Kurdish politicians uh, two weeks after that local election success, uh, where tens of thousands of Kurdish activists and uh, elected officials were imprisoned. So, um, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to go on board. I don't agree with the premise that the Kurds are the ungrateful ones in Turkey. Thank you very much. All right, let's take a few more questions, please, over here. Um, Selim Sazak, Brown University. I'll be asking two questions, if I may, one to Mr. Özcan, the other to Dr. Um, Erdemir. Um, I am an urban secular, and I don't see a question about the June elections, the June 2013 elections being a missed opportunity. But I think there's an important part of that question that's going unnoticed. At that time, I was living with a uh, Turkish partner who was besotted with Mr. Demirtas. She voted for Mr. Demirtas. I did not, she did. Um, once the election failed, we, we were unable to uh, set up a uh, coalition government. Within a few months, the stadium that I went to to watch games, Vodafone Park, blew up, um, thanks to Kurdish militants. The bus I took to university every day in Ankara got blow up at the Güven Park bus stop. So I don't think that my partner would ever be able to vote for HDP in good conscience anymore. She did that once, she has buyer's remorse. I'll be seeing her tonight. I would like to be able to leave here with an argument to make on your behalf, because I think that it's impossible for Turkey to take a right direction without us solving the Kurdish problem. But I think there is an argument your party, since you're a representative of the HDP, your party has to make to the urban seculars who reached out to your party and are feeling buyer's remorse, I really hope that I could leave with an argument to make tonight. And another question I have for Dr. Erdemir, um, the question about Akshenar's party. Um, one of the issues in the Turkish political structure is the electoral threshold. And if 
Akshana performs in the way she seems to be performing, it seems like Erdogan is going to get less votes, but more seats, exactly in the way he came to power in 2012, because he had one third of the vote, two thirds of the seats. Do you think that we would end up winning at the ballot, but losing more seats at the parliament? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Selim. And one more here. Hi, I'm, I'm Sinan Hasturan. I'm an economic and political analyst here in Washington, DC. Um, my question um, has to do with the enduring popularity of Mr. Erdogan. Um, now there's been all, to all kinds of talk here of him being all powerful and controlling everything. I wonder if that has to do with his consolidation of power across the bureaucracy and across the media, or is it also because, or is it mainly because he also speaks to a certain um, segment of the population or even the majority of the population, you know, picking up on certain themes that perhaps um, that no one else is able to address as effectively. And part of my motivation for asking that is actually, I got asked, I get asked by my European friends all the time about why he's so popular in Europe as well, you know, among the Turkish population. So I think there, um, there's similarity there. Um, and secondly, I also have always wondered, um, you know, how, um, you know, um, how everything seemed so positive in the early 2000s with the democratization agenda, you know, touching on something Mr. Aydemir alluded to, rule of law, um, establishing civil rights and liberties, expanding um, or establishing civilian control over the military. Um, they didn't make electoral sense back in the early 2000s to move forward with this agenda um, and how, what changed in the 2010s to give this impression that Turkey is headed or that AKP is headed in the opposite, exact opposite direction with the um, authoritarian um, tendencies. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we've got one more here, please. Hello, my name is Andrew Birch. I'm from IHS Market. I'm an economist covering Turkey. Um, looking at uh, what could be uh, a projected uh, direction for politics uh, for the government. Uh, is the Zarab case something that could finally be the, the smudge on Erdogan, as Mr. Kuru uh, mentioned, uh, it, that prompts people to start to lose faith in him if, if it, it shows the direct uh, corruption that goes all the way up to him? And following on that, if there is a post-Erdogan world, uh, is that coming from a split within the AKP? Or is that coming from an outside one of uh, the uh, alternative parties right now or a new party? Um, I know there was much more talk about kind of a split within the AKP a few years ago, but is that still a possibility, especially with uh, as, as the corruption, uh, evidence of corruption mounts? Excellent. Oh, very, very quickly, please. Sure. Um, my name is Dimitar Bechev. I'm speaking later today. Um, one of the consequences of one-man rule anyway in the world is that institutions are hollowed out. I mean, it becomes just manual control by one individual. Do you see that happening in Turkey? And if yes, uh, what are the long-term consequences? Maybe in a decade or a post-Erdogan um, era, if that happens. Okay, so actually a lot of interrelated questions here um, in terms of uh, sort of institutional constraints and Erdogan's role and what might happen in terms of division and, and potential dissent. Um, let's quickly do the buyer's remorse question. So what can the HDP say to people who voted for Demirtas and now are disappointed? I mean, firstly, I want to specify that there's no kind of implication that the HDP in any way approves of that kind of violence anywhere in Turkey, uh, whether it's from the PKK or the state security forces. Um, but what I'd want you to go and tell, I actually tell yourself too, is that um, there was a process whereby that kind of violence was sidelined for more than two years. And so in order to uh, ensure that that kind of violence doesn't return, we need to empower the HDP. We need to uh, open the paths of legitimate political representation in Turkey. And so I think the HDP's role in that is, uh, in positive terms, more significant than the other way around. And so uh, what I'd like your friend to know 
is that the HDP is working really hard to ensure that that kind of violence just does not return to Turkish politics or Turkish society anywhere in the country. And uh, the responsibility there, I would argue, falls more with the government who has again imprisoned who your friend voted for, uh, the co-chairs of that party, has closed those channels again, and who are now, I mean, it's not that stadium bombing was, I think, last year, but right now there are clashes going on in eastern Turkey on almost a daily basis. And uh, the one thing I'd say is that the empowerment of the HDP, the, the opening of the channels whereby the HDP can actually conduct its politics is uh, going to be significant for that kind of violence not to return to the urban centers of the rest of the country. Okay. Um, so we've only got about uh, nine minutes left, so why don't we have the three other panelists, if you want, kind of group the questions and choose what you'd like to ask, uh, what you'd like to answer to. So, Gunesh? Uh, I mean, the question about institutional decays is very important, and I agree with that. Uh, you can basically make the argument that there has been a huge institutional decay and deterioration in Turkey in the last five or six years. But I would say that it is not just because of the one man, it's because of like the, I think what the Gulen network did for a long time. They basically just like have their followers in the different parts of the judiciary and the police. And they obviously like engage in all these like uh, very clandestine operations. And we, we can obviously discuss like their extent the, of their role in the coup attempt, but at least my, from my perspective, there was a huge major role played by the Gulen network in the coup attempt. And the question is basically whether the mastermind was the uh, Fethullah Gulen himself. I don't know. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, in a sense, like the institutional decay is also caused by the Gulen Network's actions, uh, like alongside with the, what is happening nowadays. And I mean, one maybe more controversial topic, yeah, I mean, the attacks like the, the person with the urban secular background, with the, like the typical Turkish guy. <laughs> but I mean, yes, in a sense, at some point, I think it is important to say that, well, political responsibility, if you basically engage in politics, you have to take responsibility. I mean, of course, nobody can basically say that well, HTP was responsible for bomb attacks that killed lots of civilians in Turkey. But at the same time, it is kind of always a big question for the Kurdish, like the moment, whether you want to pursue the armed struggle with all the basically pitfalls, or whether you basically put all your eggs in a single basket, which is basically Turkish democratization. And the problem is obviously kind of like ongoing problem. If you basically do the both, a certain point they basically conflict. And they basically, especially the arms struggle obviously undermines the Turkish democratization from like the, with the participation of the Kurdish movement. Because ultimately, I mean, even if you basically only kill soldiers or police, people will get upset. And they will always accuse the Kurdish party for this responsibility. And this is always the question I think the Kurdish movement is going to encounter in the foreseeable future in Turkey. So this, I think, unavoidable from a more, maybe more realistic perspective. Did you want to speak to the popularity of Erdogan or post Erdogan? Yes, politics I mean, or of course. I mean, it's basically always the case that I mean, I live in Florida, Central Florida. We have lots of deplorable, deplorables. So you can make the argument that well, deplorables vote for the Erdogan and then they vote for Trump are present in this country. Well, obviously, it is that it doesn't make sense. It is not an explanation. I mean, I think we have to basically, especially in Erdogan's case, I mean, you have to basically look at how he basically took over country in 2002. And then how but the situation basically for many conservative people in the country, I mean, from their perspective, there's a huge progress, huge gains, like all the authoritarianism and repression aside, because I think at least from their perspective, they see really improvement in their lives uh, over the 15 years. I think this is the major factor more than anything else, but it doesn't change the fact that he's always a very polarizing figure. If there are many people who love him, there are obviously people who hate him. Exactly. Yeah. And certainly speaking in terms of the tang tangible benefits that uh, individuals who might vote for the AKP, um, the th that's what they're looking for. A lot of that will uh, have to do with the economic panel that we'll have uh, following this, so we'll leave those questions for that panel. Um, Ahmed, want to comment on this? So about the popularity in the referendum, he was expecting to get more than 50%. He couldn't. Now he is taking revenge from the mayors by firing them uh, in an abnormal way. but. Although he doesn't have 50% popularity in Turkey, he do still does have popularity among the Islamic conservatives and some nationalists in Turkey and Europe, including Germany. So this popularity has been based on some material progress economically, some ideological expectations they have. Finally, they have a strong man, praying Muslim and nationalistic discourse. And I think it's also based on a very strong propaganda. It's a propaganda machine, very successful. 
And then the last thing about the possibility about uh, the impact of Zarab case, I think in the short run it will not have any impact because of the fact that there's a propaganda, even the Doha media is censoring the case, they are not reporting accurately. There is very little real media in Turkey and definitely Doha media is not one of them. And then the Future, I have two scenarios. One, the worst, the other best. Should I say the negative one first? Either one you want. So, Leave us with something positive. Okay, Rarely so happens the negative one is that Erdogan will stay, the regime will stay. After himself, his son-in-law will continue. Then eventually, in the long run, there will be a secularist backlash. It will be like young Turks coming after Abdul Hamid II. This is a secularist dictatorship. The best scenario possible is that each and every group in Turkey will take lesson from the mistake, from the crimes, from the immoral things they have done, and this will turn into a learning process and Turkey will become an electoral democracy again. Okay, thank you very much. Icon, your thoughts? Okay, my response to Mr. Sazak's question, uh, yes, I have done a couple of seat projections based on the first two polls available for E-Party, and uh, my own simulations also show that in three-party and four-party uh, seat distribution uh, scenarios, AKP uh, manages to retain either a razor-thin victory, parliamentary, uh, sorry, majority, or uh, in the three-party scenario, uh, a supermajority, uh, giving it the possibility to single-handedly dictate a new constitution, if there is still any need to tweak with that. Uh, and, and my comment on this is, this is a silver lining for E-Party, because Erdogan now has a tactical reason for E-Party to survive. So he can choose not to crush this new party, because it can be a kind of a, a safety uh, for him to uh, guarantee parliamentary majority. Quick response to the institution's question. I think, you know, in a decade or two, the, when we look back, and hopefully some of this uh, insanity will be behind us, the lasting legacy of 11 years of Erdogan-Gülen alliance from 2002 to December 2013 will be hollowed out institutions. Uh, and hollowed out institutions, I think, will remain with Turkish citizens beyond the life term of these two individuals. Uh, and ultimately, uh, many of the structural difficulties Turkish citizens will have to live on a day by day. I'm, I'm not blaming everything on you know, the 11 years of Gulen Erdogan alliance, but I'm saying that the hollowing out of the institutions will matter significantly and will have lasting effects. And very quickly, the last comment. What changed in 2010? Uh, I, I think what really changed was September, what changed Turkey was September 12th, 2010. That is the day of the referendum where um, Erdogan Gulen alliance at its best, and with the support of the European Union as well, pushed this referendum. Many of my liberal friends, some of my Marxist friends, most of my EU colleagues, they said this is the best thing after sliced bread. They said, ah, oh, yes, it's not yet mezam evet. They said, yes, but it's not you know, good enough, but it's, it's a good step. Whereas I and a few of my you know, regressive colleagues, we fought hard, nail and tooth, against this referendum and warned everyone, no, this will lead to such a consolidation of power, it will destroy Turkey, we said, but we were the crazy secular old elite. Now, I think what changed Turkey was that referendum. Why? Because on September 13th, from the point of view of Erdogan and Gülen, the battle was over. The seculars were defeated once and for all, never to recover ever again. So on September 13th, the question was no longer how to destroy these stupid seculars, but the question was, how do we share the cake? Because now the cake is ours. Maybe lucky for us seculars, they didn't agree on a, you know, uh, equitable distribution of the cake. And since that day, they started fighting for how to slice up the cake. So I think what changed in Turkey is um, once you destroy polyarchy, you know, I, I'm not saying pluralism, I'm not saying democracy, I'm not saying rule of law, polyarchy, the fact that there are different 
circles of power. And once you destroy that, which I believe was destroyed with September 2010 referendum, uh, then uh, it was all, it was doomed to be a, a downhill journey for all of us. So the next important stage in Turkish political history is how to reconstitute polyarchy again. You know, how do we move from one man rule with a few tactical alliances to a Turkey where there are multiple semi-autonomous centers of power where not out of benevolence and respect and democratic values, but simply out of realpolitik that we choose not to torture and kill and kind of uh, destroy one another. Thank you, and I think it's excellent to kind of end on, on looking at some of the points that we might not necessarily consider as crucial in Turkey's path forward. Um, and I think the 2010 referendum is one of them. If you remember, one of the things that changes in the 2010 referendum is that those who were involved in the 1980 coup can be prosecuted. Um, and you saw that kind of moving forwards towards the Organicon trials and the Gulen and AKP collaboration in that. Um, so thank you for highlighting that, some of the events that we don't necessarily notice. Thank you very much. Again, so many of the things that we talked about are intricately related to economics, to foreign policy, so you definitely want to stick around for those panels. Thank you so much to my panelists and to all of you for your questions and participation. Thank you.